Hey everybody, welcome to Challenged Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt, our next guest, 2016 Paralympic bronze medalist, Ooh. Mr. Mohamed Lana. How you doing, Ma? Good, 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 and you? Everything is awesome, bud. Everything is really, really good. I see you got some nice drawings behind you. Oh, man. We're yeah. going all over the house now. <laughs> I was going to say, how are you guys powering through uh, all the craziness that's been going on? Oh, man. So I have three kids, and uh, during school time, it's very hard to wake them up for school. And now, like 6.30 a.m., they are up. <laughs> I don't know how this is working. <laughs> so before, you couldn't get them up for school. Now yeah. they're like up before the sun comes up. I don't know. It's like every day. <laughs> that is so wild. So Mohammed, growing up in Morocco, yeah. and knowing that uh, you were knowing that you were different, right? You're missing your femur on one side. What? When did you? When did you realize that? You know, I'm, I'm not the same as the other kids. Yes. And yeah. how did the other kids treat you? Well, so uh, like in Morocco, we play a lot outside. Like we just yeah. go open the door and we start playing soccer all the time. And I start, I start to hear in this word, which you mean disabled in English, um, like when we lose or I don't do a good move or something like that. And sometimes I will start crying and go, go home. Yeah. And that's happened so often. My mom just starts sending me back. She would not comfort me or anything. She will just deal with it go back and i think this is where i realized that i'm different and uh, i had to cope with it with time so kids sometimes are nicer sometimes are not so just, just like if they're winning uh, they're very happy and nice if not they blame yeah. somebody <laughs> so early on i remember you, mom and dad were basically just taking you to the local shoemaker yeah. right to basically because <laughs> you're, you're you're little you're two little legs and at that point they would put a little heel on the bottom yeah. of the leg that wasn't that had didn't have a fever on it, right? So that yeah, you even you out so that you could play yeah. with the other kids. So yeah. when did it get to the point where there are all these different foam heels on the bottom? It got to the point where okay, this isn't going to work yeah. much longer. So I was I was very active and I I go outside and run a lot. So my parents every time they would take me to the shoemaker, and he add whatever foam of layer has it around so i end up with different colors like from pink blue purple anything whatever and then uh as i'm growing the the heels are starting to get like uh, higher and like i i fall a lot i break them a lot so it got to a point where it just got too expensive and my my parents switched me to crutches so, so i don't remember exactly yeah yeah but you were so you're playing sports on crutches yeah yeah and for soccer, that works okay. Uh, when did you find endurance sports? When did you f figure out how to ride? And how did you ride a bike early on? Oh, so, uh, so I used crutches for like good six years. And then I went to this um, elementary school, which is, has only uh, kids with disability. So all the elementary school, only kids with disability. And they also, they have like this artisanal shop where they make us prosthesis right. and I had like for all my elementary school and um, middle school I have this leg made of wood and bar of aluminiums and leather and it was just straight to one piece like I couldn't like I couldn't bend it has no knee nothing right so I had that like for all the way through through high school and how, did you, I was, how, how did that connect to your to your to that one to the, to the bad leg did you strap it on yeah, so it's like it has a sh it's like a little shoe made of leather, and they have extension with with aluminium bars going from the top all the way down, and they have this piece of wood that have a foot, and the rest is little foam. So it was like very, like mid age, <laughs> leg, <laughs> but it was working. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a rat. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, I had it. I had it for a long time, and until so, so I couldn't cycle with that or anything. I would watch. I would just watch kids cycle uh like in my neighborhood yeah. and i remember because i couldn't cycle and i didn't have bike sometimes they would let just me let me do downhill or the kids would push me uphill just to be like 
you know, because like in this neighborhood, not everybody has a bike. Like one kid had a bike and we had to rotate and he was so nice to us. So yeah. So um, the first time I rode my bike, it was, was when I was 24 year old. Yeah. So, 24? Yeah. That's the that first, first time you rode a bike. Yeah, the first time, yeah. So that was the first time I had my a leg with, with, with the articulation, yeah. So getting that leg, that, yeah. that, that basically opened up the whole world to you. Oh, man, yeah. It's, it's, it, so, so the story behind that leg yeah. is, uh, yeah, so my dad is a taxi driver in Casablanca and he always tried to like, find a solution for me. And somehow he ended up with this guy talking about this um, French uh, uh, service that they have in Casablanca that's only for veteran. Right. And we went there and we asked and they say, we don't make legs for uh, people, but once in a while we have this, this uh, training, um, like a uh, training camp for, uh, to educate the local prosthetist. Uh -huh. So they bring an expert from France and this guy came and they invite us to, to have people to make legs for them. So it was a win-win. So it's free for me and for them to learn how to make a leg. So that was my first leg with the knee. And that guy was organizing this, uh, like this uh, uh, mountain bike track in Morocco between like uh, an MPT from France and Moroccan. And he asked me if I want to join. And I said, I never, I never cycled before, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to jump in. So yeah, so it was a six months earlier when he asked me to do that and we ended up managing to have a bike and we jo we j I joined the group for 500 kilometers in the Atlas mountain. And for me, that was the first time I start bike visiting in the country. It was yeah. just a sense of freedom that I never forget in my life. It was, it was amazing. So wow. since that yeah. time, I didn't stop like riding endurance. Yeah. No, I was going to say, because I look at, you know, 2007, the Marrakesh Trophy, and then you swim yeah. Gibraltar Strait in 2010, 2013 Marathon de Saab, which is only, what, 250K over six days. <laughs> then you do Ironman World Championship in Kona in 13 hours. You go to Rio. I mean, it's like once you got this leg, it was almost like the, the flood doors are open. I am an athlete. I'm an adventurer. Get the heck out of my way. Yeah, it was, it was like a snowball momentum because I was working full time at, in Morocco. And once I had the leg, I started doing like the, the Marrakesh Trophy for mountain biking in Morocco. Like I would go for a weekend for some adventure and I start triathlon in 2008 and it just kept growing. I did the first uh, sprint. I remember my first sprint was in Tunisia and I didn't have a wetsuit, it was so cold, and I throw up twice on the blue carpet, but I felt so good, and I was so happy that I finished, and like, uh, it just kept growing, like, I wanted to do Ironman, and then at one moment, I said, you know what, I'm gonna stop my job, I quit my job, and I went to France for a year, where I was just training, and trying to go to the, the ITU World Championship in Beijing, and then eventually that leads you to Rio. Yes. And you go, you're, you're racing from in the, in the first ever paratriathlon Paralympic yeah. Games, right? It's the first time the paratriathlon is part of the games. And I think it was you and Mark Barr that come down yeah. to the two of you guys for that bronze medal. Had you ever yes. beaten Mark before? No. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> maybe in Wildflower Triathlon, but in ITU series, never. Never, right? In ITU stuff. And, but that was really when the first paratrize that was in ocean, right? Where you, there was a little yeah. bit of surf. You jumped yeah, off yeah. a boat and swam in and that, that the surf really was the difference. You got out and Mark struggled a little bit to get out. Yeah, so what's happened is I was watching the able body uh, like racing. It was in the same venue. And I watched, I think Henry Schoolman or somebody was gliding like at the exit using the waves. And I said, wow, that must be like, that must be an advantage to use. And I know a lot of people were scared of the water quality, so they didn't do any open, like they didn't any training or anything. But because I was by myself, I just went like I was the whole week training there. I was doing a lot of yep. uh, swim in Copacabana before the race. So I was practicing swim exit a lot using the waves. And I remember I lost my goggles like three times and just practicing the swim exit. So it was, it was very helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did that change things for you when you get a bronze medal? 
Oh man, so, so two months earlier, it was a world championship in Netherlands and I finished sev seventh and I wasn't happy. I was so devastated. So, um, so I just went back with my coach, Matt Dixon, who was just trying to uh, like get some free seconds, like work on transition. Mm -hmm. I was like practice between transition with crutches or the running leg, practice wetsuits, practice U-turns. And we just went with that spirit just to do a lot of uh, visualization and like practice as much as possible. And I think that gives me a lot of confidence. And uh, yeah, since then, it's, it's, it's crazy. I still can't believe it. What's fascinating to me is you get the bronze medal and you're, you're at the, now you're in the Olympic Training Center, living with the family, getting ready for yeah. 2020 games. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, by the way, your category has gone. We're not yeah. doing your category anymore. And so then you, you move into cycling, yeah, right, yes. since you're there. Is, is the plan still to go for cycling? And does this extra year give you more time? And now you're an American citizen, too. Yeah, yeah. The US. yeah. yeah definitely, yeah. So I, I'm so lucky because uh, um, I couldn't make it for the, the 2020 because yeah. I was slower. But now, um, I mean, it was, it was a good experience switching to cycling because it's different, different beasts. Like, right. even though in triathlon we do cycling, doing pure cycling, it's totally different. So n since 2008, I have learned a lot uh, and I know, know what, like, which, which race I can do better. So um, I, I, definitely this extra year is gonna give me another time to sharpen my 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 skills and and hopefully qualify for it so you're deep at heart you're you're an adventurer and yeah. when andre kyler calls and goes hey listen i've got this idea we're going to go from the lowest part of uh south america to the highest part of south america we're in it's going to be me a uh, guy who's a double above knee amputee and it's going to be lucas onan who's uh got a, a dealing with an arm issue and yourself and you know you're going to finish going up Aconcagua which is only what 22,841 feet yeah. and it wasn't long from the point I heard about this to, to okay we're leaving I mean did it seem like it just happened quickly uh so for me it's just like it's been a long time I didn't do any long distance stuff yeah since I was like yeah just doing triathlon sprint and then cycling like just the kilo so for me it just like ignited that flame so when he say we're going for six weeks I told my wife oh, I'm going for this adventure for four weeks somehow like that so I just tried to sell it uh and uh to her <laughs> so um, I mean, like I was, I was worried about the bike because I know I didn't have the, like, I, it's been a long time. I didn't do that, that, that long. Like we did like 2,500 kilometers in 14 days in a gravel bike. And it was, it was crazy. And sometimes we had to ride like all the way to midnight yeah. and we had all sorts of adventure there. Like, I mean, and then the mountain, I have no experience in the mountains. I never climb a mountains and like even like the gear, the mountain gear, I didn't see it until we landed in Argentina. I didn't try the shoes, I didn't try the gear, anything. I was just going, okay, let's do it. Let's see what we can do. Uh, the, the mountains was, was very, very challenging. I was the first one got hit by, by mountain sickness. Yeah. So I was throwing up, headache, nausea. And I would wake up in the middle of the night throwing up and my, also my nose bleeding. It's so miserable, like some nights. But uh, it was a very good uh, team. We, had, we were supporting each other and we were playing it day by day. And yeah, we made, we made it to the top. 22,841 feet for a guy who's never been up. I mean, you were in Colorado dealing with some altitude, but 22,000, that's a different yeah, it, it, totally oh, yeah. entirely. So what has CAF brought to the table for you? What has CAF meant to your life? I mean, all the stuff that we were talking about, this is, this is because of CAF. I remember in 2009, um, I went to the first uh, SDTC uh, like forever. And then uh, at the time I was, I was using a racing wheelchair for the run part because doctors told me I couldn't run. Right. And, and, and so, and, and like the, the day before, it was the first time I, I, I watched the, the run clinic for the kids. 
And for me, that moment, it's still stuck in my mind. Like seeing all these kids with these tiny blades running and having fun and happy. It's like, it's so heavenly. Like I still remember that day. And then I was, so I had the, the chance to talk to Sarah and I told her like, I want to run, but the doctors told me that I couldn't run. I have PFFD, blah, blah, blah. I say, yes, I think you can run. Um, I say, but you don't understand. I have a PFFD. Say, I understand. I have a PFFD too and I can run. So I, it's still like that conversation was still like, I still remember it very well in the middle of the field with Sarah. So since that time, I mean, I end up doing the, 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 the running leg on my wheelchair, but I moved back home to Morocco and I applied for the grant and I got my first running leg. And it was just crazy since then. Love it. Okay, Mohammed. now we're moving into rapid fire. These are quick Ooh. questions. Best CAF memory? Uh, it's it's 2000, 2009, uh, the run clinic for the kids, yeah. Yeah, that did it. What's your go-to comfort food? Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream. Most recent TV show binge? Uh, uh, do you guys watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> I love it. One of my favorite shows. <laughs> uh, favorite book or podcast? Uh, Bob, uh, Breakfast with Bob from Kona. Of course. Like that of course. Kona the is the best. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the person you miss seeing the most during this crazy time? Uh, so I, my, my cycling teammates, yeah. I, I, I miss them yeah, a lot. Place you can't wait to visit when this is over? Kona. Kona. Yes. Favorite thing to do with the kids? Uh, cycling, yeah. We, we go a lot cycling around the block. Just have fun, yeah. What words do you love to hear from a coach? <laughs> I think when, when they are like, when they say, wow, what's that? Or something like that. When they are, didn't expect that. Yeah. When you surprise them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what words do you hate to hear from a coach? When they say, ah, oh, that's good. Or something like that. Like they are not like satisfied with that, but they, they, they want to cheer you up. I know it's not true. So for people out there, challenge athletes out there who are struggling right now, what's your message yeah. to them? Uh, I, I believe that physical activity helps a lot to clear your mind, uh, be healthy and look at things very positively, uh, whatever level, what, whenever the level, like just walking around the block, uh, just, I mean, I don't know anything that can start to make you active. Uh, it will, it will change your mind. I, I myself, I've been athlete all my life. And if I stop or if I'm in a good, bad mood, I will go for a run, 20 minute run, and I will just be happy again. Just do something. Yeah. Love it. Mohammed Lana has been our guest. Mohammed, thanks for being such a great part of our CAF family, my man. Love Thank it. Thank you. Again, Thank Challenged you. Athletes Live. My name is Bob Babbitt. Check us out. Thanks again, Mohammed. You are the best. Thank you, man.